the young people on my left and right are full of hope and ambition and plans and new projects. They represent, to a very large extent, the future of Off Broadway as well as its past. Uh, so let me introduce them and then the old fool in the middle will shut up and will ask one question and let him rip. Um, on my left is the esteemed co-founder and artistic director of the Living Theater, which began, I think, in an Upper West Side apartment and moved to a theater on 14th Street and had some years of peregrination all over the world and now resides on the Lower East Side. On, is it Clinton Street? Clinton Street. Yes. And uh, Judith Molina is in rehearsal for a brand new play about Korach. It's open. Hmm? It's open. We it's open. open. I beg your pardon. I, 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 oh, your sense open. is terrible. Oh, uh, <laughs> but, so the new play is about the first anarchist and who didn't want to follow Moses. We'll hear more about this later, I'm sure. Um, Judith is the winner of a Lifetime Achievement Obie Award, as well as Obie Awards for performance and directing on many astonishing occasions. She is one of the people, one of the very few people who can say that she has not only changed the face of the theater, but has changed the world to a certain extent. <laughs> and this is something we should all think about when we go into the arts. And this also has something to do with what Off-Broadway is. On my right is a man who probably needs no introduction. Except having his name pronounced. Except having his name pronounced correctly. <laughs> and he too is a playwright and a director and occasionally a performer who gets laughs while other people are speaking. Um, <laughs> Best time. Hmm? Best time. <laughs> it's not looked on with favor by colleagues. Uh, his new play, his most recent play, Me, Myself, and I, was produced off-Broadway this year, as a great many of his plays have been in the past. And now my mic is off. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good. I, I don't know if I'm projecting or if the mic is actually working. But we'll hope. And on my far right is Osvaldo Ozzy Rodriguez, who is a most important figure in the life of La Mama ETC, dedicated to the playwright and all the arts of the theater, because he is the, the director of the La Mama archive. That does not mean he is an archivist but he is the person who runs the place and a remarkable place it is. He is a playwright and a director. He began as a performer at La Mama in the late 60s and uh, has won awards for his own writing and directing and has founded theaters of his own as well as working pretty constantly over there at 74A East 4th Street. And I'm here on behalf of Ellen Stewart. And he is here, he says, on behalf of Ellen Stewart. He's too self-effacing. He asked, because we're sitting in the Provincetown Playhouse, what's left of it, we're sitting in a place that um, was here in Greenwich Village, taking risks and not worrying about money. What was that line in the movie? Of the, it is one of the most important theaters in America, and yet it has never made money. What an interesting phenomenon that statement is. Yes, but why the but? That's the interesting phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. And it has never made any money. <laughs> yes. It might even be thought of as a point of pride. But what I wanted to ask, because this theater was here in the 1910s and 1920s, with people in it taking risks but not making any money. Um, Didn't O'Neill have his sea plays done here? He had a great many yes, plays yes. done here. Yeah. There was a moment in the mid-20s when the back wall of this theater, which was logistically different, was lined with NYPD riot police 
because a play of O'Neill's was premiering here, and the police had heard that at the first act curtain, a black actor playing a black man, which was unusual in American plays at the time, was going to kiss the hand of a white woman. And they assumed that an off, even an off-Broadway audience would riot at such a sight. So uh, there's a piece of history for you. And that's what I wanted to ask, starting with you, Judith, when you began to make theater off-Broadway, were you conscious of predecessors? Were you conscious of a history coming into this? We were certainly uh, uh, conscious of the Provincetown players. We were conscious of history of uh, what was at that time called Little Theater. And I remember my teacher, Erwin Piscotter, in his uh, heavy German accent saying, here, the little theaters should be called the great theaters, and the great theaters should be called the, 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 the commercial theaters. <laughs> and it is. And uh, uh, I've always had a problem with the nomenclature of off-Broadway. Uh, there was a time, 61, when the Living Theater first toured into Europe, and we came back and we found out we were an off-Broadway theater. And I said, what are we off Broadway? We're, you know, we're what we are. And we're certainly not Broadway, but well, we don't want to be off Broadway as a, a designation. And uh, then, of course, we became off, off Broadway. And even though we fought it, we lost those battles. Those are, uh, those are the designations <coughs> of small theater in New York. And uh, I don't think it's a fortunate term. I would rather be called something else than off Broadway. Living uh, seems a very good term for what you do. And it, I, but I think the issue is, did you, did you, were you conscious of the tradition, not the nomenclature, but what the Provincetown players did? Did you model yourself on it? Did you set yourself against it? Did you set out to modify it? Uh, we only wanted to live up to it. It was a great, uh, uh, it was a great uh, uh, goal for us uh, to achieve what the Provincetown Players had achieved for a small theater to break through new forms and into new experiments and into further fields. And uh, all we wanted was uh, to be worthy of that tradition and we tried to be, and I would never refute that tradition. I think we're still following that tradition. Here, here on that one. Edward, how about you? Your first play was staged in this theater in 1960. Yes, it was, but I want to, I want to go back before that. Okay. But before I do that, I want to talk to you about something related to what you mentioned about the uh, riot police there for O'Neill's uh, uh, end of the first act with, with a black man kissing a white woman. You think it got much better by the 1940s? No way. I was uh, trying to get thrown out of uh, college. <laughs> I succeeded finally in 1946, 47. I was in Hartford in 1946 going to college, and there was a production there of The, the Duchess of Malfi, not a bad play, starring the famous Viennese whisperer, uh, Elizabeth Bergner. You had to sit in the second row and you couldn't, <laughs> couldn't hear anything. And her paramour was played by a very, very, very fine young actor by the name of Counter de Lee. Now, Counter de Lee was a black man. He was not permitted to play that performance except in whiteface in Hartford in 1946. So things didn't get much better very quickly, did they? No, I think there was a long struggle. I tell you. Was he permitted to kiss her hand? Oh, yes, they did a lot of stuff. But <laughs> they, he was in whiteface, so it was OK. And none of us were meant to know who he was, so that he was a black man. So I guess it was all right. So, so I got thrown out of college in 48. In, in and uh, 
uh, thrown out from the family that had adopted me when I was a tiny little thing, and uh, sent off into the world, and I came straight here to Greenwich Village. Uh, and I've lived south of 14th Street ever since. Um, I started going to the theater, but let me tell you a little bit more. Some of you aren't old enough to know what it was like. You are, maybe. You can go up to something. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I'm older <laughs> It was a very exciting time in the arts in New York City in the late 40s, in the 50s, and in the early 60s. Uh, everything was changing, everything was happening uh, in the visual arts, the abstract expressionist movement in the 50s had come in, and all the painters were down here doing wonderful, wonderful paintings. Um, the theater was doing uh, exciting work. Uh, the poets were over at, at what used to be the uh, a tavern on, 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 on Bleecker and, uh, and, and, and uh, the Dougal. The San Remo. Yeah, the San, San Remo. Remo. All the poets would be there. And uh, we kept going to theater. It was exciting. I believe somewhere in the early 1950s, I saw a play here called The Dog Beneath the Skin, or Who Was Francis? Terry Lane. Written by W.H. Auden and Christopher Isherwood. We were seeing wonderful plays for a dollar, two dollars to get into. It was enormously exciting. Everybody was practicing exciting art, but nobody was famous, nobody knew who anybody was, and we kept going to see each other's work. We would go see the, the exhibits. We would go hear the wonderful avant-garde uh, recitals uh, up, 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 in, in uh, in, in, in the 50s in New York, and we'd go to the wonderful theaters done here and in other places. And uh, the avant-garde book market, the uh, paperback book market had just come into existence. So we could get all the avant-garde European works very cheaply, and we could get to read it. Nobody had any money, nobody had to pay much of anything to do anything. Everybody worked terribly hard, and it was fucking exciting. <laughs> it's really absolutely wonderful. I, I want to go back to Judith for a second, if I may, because you were very much part of that scene. And the Living Theater started to some extent as a poet's theater. It didn't started it? as a poet's theater. I hope it still is a poet's theater. But I mean, I like you, you were working then with, with William Carlos Williams, and, and you did the Ezra Pound translation of Sophocles. Yes, and And the, where, was there something about the need to put poetry in the theater that attracted it you. It seemed that there was a kind of breakthrough in dance and a breakthrough in uh, uh, painting and a breakthrough in music uh, that hadn't yet happened in the theater. And we were very anxious to be part of that. I was in a production of, uh, of uh, The Dog Beneath the Skin. I played Mildred Luce. Boys and all the wells! That was you, eh? Uh, we were looking for something. Uh, we were looking for the next step. And in a way, we're still looking for the next step. Because we're still not standing still. And uh, uh, we're still researching what's really possible uh, for instance, what's possible with audience participation, mm -hmm. uh, what's, in, in, what's possible uh, with non-fictional theater forms, what's possible with new playwriting, with new words, with new poetry. Ultimately, it is poetry. Ultimately, the poetry is what we strive for, and that is a good way of looking at La Mama. Asi, when you came, in the late 60s, were you, were you aware of what had been going on before? Because you came right after this huge I period of I was a very people. peculiar product of um, the High School of Performing Arts, which was a wonderful school before there were Juilliards and LaGuardia and all of these other things. Um, it was a 10-year experiment. And unfortunately, you started at 13 and ended at 17. Um, but they prepared you for Broadway the legitimate theater, the wonderful, you know, mm -hmm. everybody's dream. Uh, and of course, there, no one was writing any parts for me on Broadway. I was Spanish. 
uh, there were no major parts being written for someone my age at the time. Uh, the, uh, most of the ingenues on Broadway were 40 years old. Uh, there's nothing we could do about that. And so it became a little difficult. Um, one of the things that I, is I find particularly, looking, looking back at the history of uh, the Provincetown Playhouse, one of the things I noticed in the development of the Provincetown Playhouse, there was a kind of um, coming together of journalists, writers, uh, poets, coming together to form some kind of an expression. This started out in Provincetown, of course, and then when it was brought into New York. Um, so there was a, a, a very cohesive kind of deliberate attempt to, fi to find something, to experiment with each other. Now, that happened just before World War I, okay? After the Korean War, there was the beginnings of the Vietnam War. We were entering the 60s. I arrived at La Mamba around 1967. I had a very successful career in publishing. I was making money, but was dreadfully unhappy. And of course, every writer that I ran into wanted to get into publishing, wanted to be published. Um, in any case, there was no career. When I first went to La Mama, I did it as a favor to someone because I had given up the theater. I thought, this is ridiculous. There's no place for me. No one is waiting for me, and I'm not doing anything. So I made a career in publishing. As a favor to uh, one of the, the, the uh, young ladies who helped Ellen great, uh, Ms. Nellie Vivas, I don't know if you all remember, uh, a lovely Colombian journalist. Uh, I appeared in one of her plays. Unbeknownst to me, I had never been in anything that looked remotely like what this place was, okay? La Mama was originally started in a basement on 9th Street, and then it moved to a series of lofts and then a number of other places before it ever had its own permanent venue. Uh, Unlike the Provincetown Playhouse, which started out As really with, with assets that, that you could I, say I remember were my college you know? years in which one of the great challenges was looking for La Mama. Yes. Because we were never <laughs> sure what, Where when they, they were. might have to put in yeah. vacate. Yes. And I, remem I also remember Ellen on, on a panel I once did with her a few decades back saying that she had started La Mama it, essentially in her living room because all her playwright friends had plays that no one was doing and that would never be done on Broadway. Um, she had great difficulty with the police then because they saw a lot of young men going into her living room every evening and assumed she was running a house of ill fame. What is so important about this is that at the moment that La Mama was gestating or were about to begin, uh, many things were happening, and they were happening simultaneously. You had your Vietnam War, number one. You had the draft. You had the beginnings of uh, the civil riots, civil liberty riots. And then you had also the rise of feminism, and you had the gay presence suddenly making itself known. It had no outlet. What Ellen Stewart did was she provided a haven for whoever wanted to express <laughs> <laughs> Did I say something wrong? No. <laughs> I, think, I think it was the, the gay movement finding an outlet. <laughs> <game. laughs> oh, well, this is a good day to talk the about. The uniqueness that. of the Mamba was that it afforded everyone a place. It's true. She started the the, uh, the theater because a friend of hers, Freddie Light, and later Paul Foster, um, had no place to present their plays. She had no intentions. She was a, a designer. She worked for Henri Bendel. And, she, and, and, and Saks Fifth Avenue. And so what happened was she said, well, gather your friends, bring your plays, sit here, let them hear it, and that way you'll have an audience. It was a favor. It was a gesture on her part. Well, of course, no two artists travel alone. So this one brought another one, and that one brought another one, and that one brought another one. The evolution of La Mama, however, came at a time when so much was happening here. Uh, I think Edward hit it on the, on the head when he said it, there was such excitement in the air. We were the richest country in the world. We had the most educated young people, the most highly educated <coughs> people in the world because we provided. And we had communication. The television was informing us and educating us in ways and means that we were not prepared. 
We don't see the casualties of war on TV every day. We used to see them in the 60s. Mm -hmm. right. They I don't think that report. That was what made a lot of the protest a was that lot the television of, news. Precisely. The was communication that was taking that. place was taking place verbally, but also because the artists suddenly had a place where they could present their own point of view. And this is why La Mama became such an important venue. Joe Chino started it first with the Cafe Chino, the Living Theater. What year was that, 62, 62? I, I was just going to ask Edward to talk about this because you said no, tra no artist travels alone. No, and true. Edward, when you and Richard Barr began producing your plays, you also began something in the company of a large number of artists. Yeah, we had, we, had, we had an organization starting in the yeah. early 60s called Theater 1964, 65, 65, we went on for 10 years. And we produced over that time 120 new American plays, yeah. including uh, all the first plays by, by a number of rather well-known playwrights now. One can hardly count the number, yeah. I think. It was a wonderful time, and uh, um, the actors worked for free. I think we charged a dollar to get, to get in. And uh, it was the way theater should should be always, but stopped being. It, 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 was, it was so exciting. Yeah. You asked me earlier if I wanted to talk. You still want me to talk about my first experience here? Actually, I do because it's related to this. <laughs> we have to go back a little bit. In 1956, I wrote my first play, uh, with the with the exception of a, of a three act sex farce I wrote when I was 14. <laughs> um, my first play called The Zoo Story. And it had its world premiere for some bizarre reason, not in America or even in New York City, where you'd expect an American playwright to have his first play, but in German in West Berlin. Why? I don't what I think the bizarre reason is that new American plays, unless they fitted a conventional pattern, were not being done. And that was the problem that you were all up against. And so somebody translated my play into German. And a, a production company in, in Berlin read it and decided they needed a play, another hour-long play, to go with a very bizarre play by Samuel Beckett called in, in German Das Letzte Banda, Crap's Last Tape. And so in 1958, the double bill opened in Berlin and got very good reviews, which was nice, in German. <laughs> I went, you have, to go to the, you have to go to the first performance of your first play. You have to. And uh, I, I knew no German. I mean, how can you possibly spend any time understanding a language where all the verbs are at the ends of the sentence? <laughs> Let's leave that one there. Um, I went, and I had a wonderful time, you know. And I liked the Beckett play just as much as mine. <laughs> and, uh, very fortunately, there was some guy from the New York Times there who wrote a review of the evening. It was uh, by me. And, and he said in, in his piece for the New York Times, isn't it astonishing that a young American playwright has to have world premiere of his first play in German, in Berlin, Germany, rather than in New York and in English where it should be? Well, of course, they had to do it here, naturally, you know. But they were embarrassed not to. And so Dick Barr, who produced the first uh, 15 or so of my plays, I guess, um, bought the rights, both to the Beckett play and mine. I came back from the opening in Berlin to discover that I was going to have a production of my play in New York City. And I thought that was very nice. So we cast it and, and, and opened it here. Um, in those days, the um, Provincetown Playhouse was shaped a little bit more like a theater. <laughs> the rape was not so precipitous that you, that you would fall in, in, into the stage. Uh, it was uh, a regular, regular theater. Um, again, we got very, very good press here. Some people liking Beckett's play a lot, a lot more than mine. Some people liking my play uh, the, uh, a lot more, more than Beckett's. You know, the, uh, that's the way that sort of thing goes. But we ran here and uh, in various other off-Broadway theaters in the same production for three years, which was very, very nice. And uh, I never looked back. I quit the job I had delivering telegrams to Western Union and uh, decided I might as well spend some time being a playwright. 
And that was 35 ago. When you came in here for the first time, did you think of O'Neill and Susan Glassbill and George Graham Cook, or did you just think, wow, I'm having my first play produced? I can barely remember what happened the day before yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I probably knew it in some way and, and, and felt happy about O'Neill. Yeah, I didn't know who Glassbill was, of course. Why not? I don't know, because I was ignorant. I was educated in private schools. <laughs> <laughs> it might be because no one was paying attention to women playwrights then. But uh, the 60s changed that somewhat. You know, it was so exciting. This is the proper size for serious plays, by the way. Mm -hmm. A 100-seat a, a theater, 200-seat theater at most. Because uh, the intimacy, the double intimacy from what's happening on stage to the audience and what's happening in the audience to what's going on stage is, is, is so exciting. It is quite wonderful. And I'm always happier when I'm having my plays done in small theaters than in large theaters. I find it interesting that uh, your first time was done in Germany. Uh, it's one of the reasons that Ellen sent so many American plays to Europe. Mm -hmm. Because the critics in America were not paying attention to American playwrights. The irony is, of course, that once you went to Europe and you performed in Europe, you came back, you had credentials that somehow the Americans were ready to applaud. Yes, it, it, it's other, interesting nowadays that yeah. many commercial Broadway productions as, in effect try out in London. Precisely, and then come here. I thought one of the more interesting things though was that in the years 62, 63, La Mama began in 1961. But some of the first plays that were done at La Mama were by the following playwrights. If you permit me, I just want to read very quickly. Please. Tennessee Williams. Eugene O'Neill. This is not their first play. 1962. The first things you guys did. This is the first time. Yes, this is the first time. This, this was also done. true of the record for Art the Chino. There Absolutely. were a lot of Williams and O'Neill one act. Arobal, Oscar Wilde, Leonard Melfi, Pinter, Gide, Edna St. Vincent Millay, mm -hmm. George Bernard Shaw, Williams again, William Saroyan, Henri, Inesco. Okay, these were the things, this was the avant-garde of the 1960s that was being somehow <laughs> offered to the American public and also influenced so many young writers who had never had the ability to really interact with these, these other uh, uh, writers. You weren't going to find these guys on Broadway too soon. Uh, however, there was a real thirst and one of the things, again, the open door policy of both the moving theater and La Mama and the Provincetown Playhouse was uh, made it available to them. The other thing was, because, be it a naive thing or be it an ingenuous thing, because we were constantly breaking laws, we were always at the frontier. In other words, everything that was being done off, off Broadway, and I know the term offends you, however, when I was in San Antonio and I had a company, I very proudly called them off, off Broadway. <laughs> they accepted the title very well. But one of the things that happened was, because we were doing things that were technically illegal, and not technically illegal, but rather not commercial, okay? well, we were in the wrong spaces. We were advertising in the wrong way. We were uh, mixing and matching things that didn't belong. There were people who came in as light designers and ended up being set designers. People who were set designers who ended up being actors and then eventually dancers. Eventually, There was this unbelievable energy that allowed people to explore possibilities. There was nothing to lose. We certainly weren't going to lose a big budget. Not 65 million. It wasn't happening. See? This is what was there. And the thing is, it was an enthusiastic, we received enthusiastically because the door was open to everybody. So suddenly, the mama had troops that were black troops, that were Asian troops, that were Spanish troops, that were Ameri purely American troops, that were coming in from, from, from Korea, from Japan, etc. It opened the door. Because of this available interchange, this cultural interchange, the styles of the theater itself began to transcend its own limitations. So suddenly you have performance art evolving. You mentioned dance becoming an important part. Ellen's opening speech was always uh, Welcome to the Mama Experimental Theater Club dedicated to the playwright and all aspects of the theater. Well, this, all art is an aspect of the theater. Everything from set design 
to, to the floor design, the costume design, to see the design. It's all part of the Through the interaction with the audience. Oh, precisely. The precisely. And the other thing she did was she reevaluated the spaces of theaters. Now, we're talking a lot about space here. La Mama has three theaters. It produces three new shows every three weeks. We've done over 3,000 productions. I'm bragging because it's time that somebody knew about this, and I'm glad to share it with you. Um, but more importantly, the Mama spaces were created to be mobile. The minute Ellen returned from Europe, she realized that the American theater needed more. The Living Theater completely changed the relationship between the audience and the actual spectacle. It was a time when that was necessary, which immediately made everything else antique. You're not going to find Luck, paper, and gold cupids hanging from the ceiling in any one of the little theaters off of Broadway. Okay? I mean, if you are, it's a lovely decoration, but it not, was not the purpose. The purpose was <laughs> to communicate what was essential, and that was the play, the production, the actors, all of the material that was being presented, given and explored at the same time. It was also communicating the most important things, social events of the day and attacking those things that were no longer American enough for us, that were no longer describing who we were. Uh, this is one of the things that, that, that afforded so many young artists the ability to present their, their, their material. I'm talking too much. Yeah, yeah, in spite of the fact that we, we might consider the golden age of off-Broadway or off-off-Broadway to be with, with the Living Theater and, 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 and La Mama, uh, it really began at the end of the Second World War. Uh, and, and, and our, our knowledge of, of what was going on intellectually and creatively in Europe was open to us again. And that's when the theater started being enormously exciting. That's when, why I could see terribly exciting plays that uh, I didn't even know about until, uh, until uh, uh, the mid-40s. It, it really began serious theater, of serious theater movement in the United States, experimental theater movement began, I think, uh, in, in the, uh, at the end of the Second World War. I think probably you could find people to say there were experimental theaters that were serious in the 20s and 30s, but what happened was the impulse had burned out and been dampened by the Depression. Yeah. And so then came the war. There was no time to think about it, although you find accounts of little individual things. One of them was Ervin Piscator's class and the theater that he founded at the New School. And Judith, that's where you began. And he taught us that the first thing is that you have to have something to say. That you have to have some reason why you're standing there in the light and these people are in the dark and you're talking and they're quiet. You have to have something really to transmit to them. So that was very important for us. And that meant for us political theater. And we're still trying to do it. And I was struck in this conversation by, uh, I think there's a French saying that says, the more it changes, the more it remains the same. Uh, because uh, uh, I'm doing a play now. I've got 25 young people uh, from 19 uh, to 30 years old. And they have all that enthusiasm that you were talking about mm -hmm. uh, in, in our early days. And they are uh, burning with fervor uh, for what they're saying. For what Ms. Carter said, they had to have something to say. And they're saying it. And it's, uh, it's very inspiring to me. Uh, we got five older actors in the, in, in the, in the cast. Uh, some of them have been with us for 25 years, and, uh, uh, and, and all these young people that are bringing us all this energy. And it reminds me of that time, because these people also, alas, had to work for six weeks with no pay for rehearsals, because we didn't have a budget when we started our play for Korach. And it's an enormous spectacle, a biblical spectacle, and uh, uh, with lots of singing and, and movement and, 
and, and the golden calf and the Mount Sinai and uh, the Holy of Holies and, uh, and no money. <laughs> uh, come see, it's interesting what happened. But this is the big challenge, is how are the artists to survive <coughs> if there is no money? In the 20s, in the 40s, everything was less expensive, including the chance to live in this city, including the space to rent to have a theater in. It's and tragic. The city was, hmm? It's tragic. I because know. these wonderful actors, with all their talent and spirit, have to go do office temp uh, uh, every day, or they have to be uh, working in a in, in a bar or a or, or a restaurant as a waiter or waitress, uh, like all the other actors in New York. And this is a tragic situation. It means we don't support our culture. Uh, uh, there's a small group of people that can make a lot of money on Broadway, and that's wonderful that they can do that. Uh, but there are hundreds of actors that that, that can't live, and and in some way, uh, our 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 society should support our culture, and and that's that's what I'm making a pitch for all the time. How do we reconstruct our society to support our culture? And especially when our culture brings bad news, which the society doesn't want to deal with. I'm thinking about the brig, because Ozzy keeps mentioning the upheavals of the 60s, and because you revived it two years ago, in that astonishing production. And I brought a young playwright to it who said, this is the newest and freshest theater I've seen in New York all year. It was an old and, I, and I said, I saw this in 1963. <laughs> a long time, for a long time, we said, we didn't want to do plays about how bad it is. We want to do plays about how good it can be. And I started on the subject of Korach uh, uh, five, six years ago with Anna Reznikov, who since uh, died and, and wasn't able to participate because we gave it up because Korach gets swallowed up by the, by the earth. And that we didn't want that, 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 that bad ending. And then we found out that there's a Mishnah, uh, <laughs> a commentary on the Bible, um, a Talmudic saying that says that Korach's sons were saved by a band of angels uh, because they were going to be the singers of the psalms in the temple. And if you look in the psalms, uh, there are 12 psalms that are designated not as the psalms of Solomon or the psalms of David, but the psalms of the sons of Korah. And so we have a joyous ending in which we, uh, in which we agree with the heretic of Korah that we are all holy and we sing and we dance and we're very happy at the end. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like a, a Mamalo production, I have to say. It, it, Edward, it doesn't sound very much like any of your plays. <laughs> <laughs> we sing and we dance and we're very happy. Oh, well, 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 these young people are all at work on new things. I, I'm in stasis. You know, I recall, I, I just recall that you, you made me recall an incident. I remember that, uh, I think it was Leonard Melfi once told me that in the early days of La Mama, the most important friend you could have was someone who worked in an office where there was a Xerox machine. <laughs> <laughs> because this was the greatest innovation since God knows what. Okay? because it meant that the playwright could duplicate their plays and hand copies out to the actors. This is one thing. I marvel at where we are today in terms of communication. I mean, I don't know any team who doesn't have to play the show attached to itself. Um, but it's, we really come quite a ways in, in, that, in that, that particular way. I also remember that when Seth Allen directed melodrama play at La Lama, written by Sam Shepard, we didn't have a drummer. And all of a sudden, Sam Shepard decided that he would help out. And so we had Sam Shepard doing the drumming to his own play. Okay? 
when I saw him years later, I went to him, I walked up to him, I said, you know, you once played the drums for a play that I was in, and I was very happy about that. And uh, I said, I'm sorry that the world lost such a potentially good drummer. And look what's happened to you. <laughs> Sam probably thought that was he the said, greatest he compliment. He thought he'd rather have been a rock musician than a playwright. But it gives you, it, just these stories, I, I don't mean to, to, to spotlight them, however, they give you a sense of the time, of what it, what it meant. Tom O'Horgan related uh, a story about how one day he, had, he was putting on a play and the audience was there and he hadn't cut the tape and mixed it so that the, all of the sound cues, none of them were ready. And so he went to Ellen in desperate you know, need and he said, Ellen, I can't do this, I'm, I, I need somebody. Get, get me somebody who can fix the tape. So Ellen came back five minutes later with someone you know, and, uh, and then Tom said, I treated him so terribly. I just screamed at him and told him what to do and blah, 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 and the man went, he fixed the tape. The play went on, the sounds were wonderful. At the end of it, Tom went to Ellen and he said, I'd like to apologize to that, that young man. He said, can you, can, where, how, where can I find him? And she said, I don't know. I just went outside and said, can anybody fix tape? <laughs> Somebody came in from the audience and did it. <laughs> this is the way things happen. One other story, and then I'll be quiet. Okay, there was something called once Cafe La Mama. Now, the reason that came into being was simple. Ellen was used to being given fines by the state, de by the department, the, the building department, the fire department, the housing department, anything you can think of, we were constantly being evicted, thrown out, doing whatever. One day, a young man came to give her a fine for occupying a space that was not designated for an audience. And so she, uh, you know, he turned around, he looked, he saw all these people doing things, moving things around. He said, what's going on here? He said, she said, look, we're just trying to do a little theater. These guys, they just want a little space to just, to, you know, for their friends and family, and whatever. You know, she played the role that she was so used to playing at this, by this time. And uh, she didn't realize he had been an actor, okay? And so he turned around and he said, well, you know, if you serve one cup of coffee, I can give you a license you call yourself a cafe, and then you can have as many people as you want in this place. She said, terrific. They collected quarters. How much is the license? Two dollars. Terrific. He said, what do I call it? Somebody said, Mama, where do you want this chair? And she said, oh, call it Mama. She says, oh, no, no. That's not she. Let's call it La Mama. Cafe La Mama. And that's where the name came from. <laughs> That's, what we, those, that's, those, that's the reality of what happened, the way things happened. First time I met Ellen, I thought she was the cleaning lady. <laughs> <laughs> I had never been in the theater, and, um, and she'll kill me, but you know, I'll tell her this. I had never been in the theater such as the one we found ourselves in. I mean, the floorboards, you could see down into the next floor. Uh, it was, you know, I was afraid for my safety. I kept thinking everything was going to fall on me, but God only knows. Again, I was coming from the High School of Performing Arts, trained to do legitimate theater. I expected something else, the Schubert maybe, but not this. <laughs> I have directed a piece at HB Playwrights Student, and okay. um, um, I came into the theater the morning before a rehearsal, and I found Uta Hagen with a bandana on her head, and dressed in, in tights, mopping the theater, and I said, oh, please let me do that. And she said, why? It's my theater. <laughs> <laughs> well, my experience was I was rehearsing, and I keep hearing this clanging, this noise, and I thought, what is going on? This is, you know, it was enough that I was in a place that was going to be condemned. That was enough for me. So I stopped, and I said, madam, could you please leave that? Could you, could you just, whatever it is you're doing, you're making a lot of noise. We can't rehearse. Could you come back a little bit later to clean the theater? She looked at me and she said, no, this has got to be done now. I have to clean this coffee pot right now. Well, the woman that I was looking at was wearing all the bracelets she ever owned, <laughs> all the jewelry you could imagine, the brightest colors. I'd never seen anything like this. It was, you know, this was her, her, her way of being. But what she was doing, she was cleaning a coffee pot with bracelets. So I was making all of this racket. <laughs> and finally, she turned around and she says, and when you leave here, you better clean up because you left it a mess the day before yesterday, and I'm not coming back here to clean. And I, I was absolutely flabbergasted. And I thought, the cleaning lady is screaming at me, and I've never written here before. I went out. I told somebody. I said, listen, this woman is screaming at me. What am I going to do? He said, so we chased her down the street. She happened to be walking with Tom O'Horgan. 
was eventually about to do it here at the time, which I didn't know, uh, and introduced me. No, no, this is Ellen Stewart, this is Hazi. That's how we met, you know. We've been, we've been that kind of, that, in that kind of a relationship ever since, you know. But, uh, so that is one of the more unusual meeting stories <laughs> among <laughs> artistic <laughs> collaborators, although I'm sure we all have similar ones. Uh, Edward, you've been looking like you wanted to say something about this kind of crisscross and, the, and the, these collaborative things that happen on impulse. It is the most exciting kind of theater. And I remember what was most exciting about it aside from the fact that uh, we all did it uh, more for love than money, that was for sure. And uh, the enormous enthusiasm and, and affection for what we were doing, whether it was any good or not. And that um, in those days, when, well, as an example, the production of um, Graf's Last Tape and the Zoo Story, which my pro producer Richard Barr did here in 19... Uh, January of 1960. That cost us a lot of money to put on here. That cost $1,200 to produce the entire evening. Isn't that extraordinary? And an equivalent evening now of those two plays in a small theater like this would cost about $500,000. Our tickets were one and two dollars each. Not in our play. Huh? Not in our place. for, for twelve hundred. <laughs> no, but the interesting thing was, the playwrights themselves helped each other. Well, of course, they we invited did. each other into each other's theaters, so yes, that if there was no room at La Mama to do a play, then you know, uh, Edward could say, "Come to the Van Damme Theater and present it here." And many, many plays were done that way. And the credentials that they achieved, that the credits that they achieved, was because it was ongoing. It became impossible for the journal, for journalists, for particularly critics, New York, to ignore what was happening underground beyond a certain point, because it was infinitely more exciting than what was going on in the commercial field. And also, it was ever changing and growing so quickly. I have Edward's permission to show you this, but this is a poster from the Mamas Experimental Theater Club presents the first coffee house theater festival. Now, here's the names of the plays that were being done. One is called Who's Afraid of Edward Albee? Oh, <laughs> and the other is called The Recluse. Okay. Now, this was being done in Mr. Albee's theater. Right? This is the kind of camaraderie that existed. This is the kind of real evolution that was possible then. And I, I'm looking forward to seeing that rebirth of wonder. The rebirth of camaraderie. I think the living theater has been striving for it during its whole career. It still is, yeah. The camaraderie with the audience, the camaraderie among the, the creative artists. But it is, it is the thing that we all build on, isn't it? Even camaraderie, God help me with critics. <laughs> it becomes collective. <laughs> no, collective yes. creation. You know, this reminds me of my favorite line from Breck which I'm going to quote in German just to please Edward, because the verb comes at the end. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, Wenn die Kür miteinander besprechen können, dann würde die Schlachthöfe nicht lang bleiben. That's from Puntela. He says, if the cows could get together and talk things over, the slaughterhouse wouldn't last long. <laughs> 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 and, I, and this brings me to Brack, to his, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the past tonight, not about our past as, as theater makers, but about the predecessors, the parents of off and off, off Broadway. And one of them is Brecht, who has been important in my life and very important in the life of And another one is equally important, and nobody really knows who he is anymore. Uh, is Pirandello. Ah. I, can say to, I can say to a young student of mine, let's talk about Pirandello, and as likely as not, the answer is going to be, where is that? <laughs> Good, I can, I can now say that my dear friend and colleague David Gordon is working on his, his 
distinct David Gordon and Valda Setterfield version of six characters in search of an author, and I'm going to see their workshop of it next week after Christmas. Um, I love Pirandello, who is one of the important people. Most important. 20th century playwright. Brecht, I think, was a new discovery at the time mm -hmm. when Off Broadway began to boom. Pirandello was already an established classic. Yes, we did Pirandello long ago. We did Brecht. <laughs> when you did when you did Pirandello, you had the the actors come into the audience and evict the critics from their seats yes. and watch them play. <laughs> uh, and, and I, I think it's I think it's wonderful that we're here in this site here, sort of speaking of its history and remembering our forebears of mm. of our work and. Uh, we all have such long histories to talk about here. Uh, I want you very much, uh, I wonder if you could indulge me uh, to hear from uh, someone who is still in his 20s. Uh, Brad Burgess has been working with me. Uh, he's been an actor and now he is the uh, 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 associate director of the Living Theater for the last four or five years. And he's uh, still in his 20s. And I thought it might be interesting, after hearing all of us, to hear a young voice about uh, what does this history mean uh, uh, to someone who hasn't lived it? We've lived some of it. Uh, but what does it mean to you? Well, I would say that it helps you understand who your peers might be. You know, we have a couple of our company members in the audience. And it kind of heralds back to what Ozzy was saying earlier, that you never really know who you're meeting when you're meeting them. And it's a sort of communal consciousness that the history teaches you. You know, don't brush anybody aside. Anybody could be your, your great collaborator. Anybody could be Ellen Stewart. You walk into our theater and you can meet Sheila Dabney, who a lot of people oh. don't know, who's marvelous, you know, and, and, and you, get, you get these opportunities and the history teaches you how to appreciate them. You know, I, I, I've just, I feel aw like awestruck just having had this seat for this conversation. It's wonderful to learn all of these building blocks, you know, about what we're doing now and where it, where it comes from. It, it, for me, it teaches, it teaches a lot of humility about, about, uh, about finding the right people to work with and making sure that you continue to work with them so that you can be able to say that you work with them for 30 plays or 40 years, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that again, thank you, Brad. What I, I, I know there's been something called inflation over the, over the past 50 years. <laughs> but the cost of producing plays has risen in ways that transcend in, 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 in inflation, you know, completely. Mm. The cost of, 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 of making art in the United States now, at least, at least in the theater, is so preposterous that the joy and the opportunity is being driven out of it for most people. Uh, it's much, much harder now for, for a young playwright to get going without being told he must compromise all of his values so that we can produce his play, <coughs> revise it so that it becomes simpler and less complex and more commercial. For about two characters. Yes, of course. So, the, so, the, so, the, so, the corruption so, 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 so. of commerce has done such serious damage uh, to the arts in the United States. You actually, uh, especially I think, have, in have the mentioned theater. the worst side of that, which is, from the audience's point of view, the cost of the ticket oh, well. is the single most corrupting and damaging thing because so many people can't afford to go to even an off-Broadway theater and off that's Broadway, not reasonable. The prices are $75. 85 it's ridiculous. It's preposterous. Well, our tickets are only $20. <laughs> and on Wednesdays, you can pay what you can, which is you can get in there for a quarter if you really have no money. So that everybody can come to see our, our plays. And I think that's a very important You know, when, when, uh, when the zoo story opened here, I, I, I said I quit my job delivering telegrams at Western Union. I was making 38 bucks a week there. And here, 
uh, I was making 60 bucks a week. And it, 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 it kept me in, 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 in beer and cigarettes, and, and that was quite enough for me. It was, it was wonderful. I'll tell you one interesting thing about theater, which is sad, and, and commerce has a great deal to do with it. Everybody is earning a great deal more money in the theater now than they used to, except playwrights. We used to receive 10% of the growth. The most a playwright gets now is 5% of the gross in a commercial production. And more and more, we're being encouraged to compromise and do, and do less and less. The playwrights are suffering from, from the commerce of theater more than the actors are, more than the designers are. I think that is, that is actually an arguable point, because once the play is up, the playwright receives the money for as long as it runs. As, as he damn well should, he wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> but the actor who does not get the role and is doing the four-week run in the off-Broadway subsidized house for what is barely a living wage for one person and who sometimes has a family to support actors with children work incessantly, I find, because they can't let their health insurance. And most, playwright, yeah. most playwrights who have plays done in, in New York City, they're lucky if they get a four-week run. Absolutely. No, it's true. So it's not that the playwrights are... are well, we also have, have, I don't, I don't, I don't have a system I that is built in. Simply, Edward, that it's not a good... It, it's, it's no use to claim precedence for one group of artists over another. The, the problem is how do we all? Okay, then I think them. everybody should have to do as badly as the playwrights do. <laughs> <laughs> have a better theater. <laughs> well, I think, I think uh, the, for instance, the, the off of work, well, the off of work with theaters have a kind of built in obsolescence because we're limited to the number of seats we have, mm -hmm. we're limited to the prices of the tickets, and we're limited to the number of performances that we can give. So if you don't, if you really cannot, in some way, get a decent review immediately, Okay, and have an audience know where and where where you are, how long you're going to be there. You're already a building obsolescence. It's, it's already you're losing money before you've even made it. Uh, it's it's part of a system that needs to be addressed again, I think, because uh, communication and also the, the size of audiences. It would be wonderful if most of the people who don't know about a play going on for the three weeks, okay. Would be had the play available to them. I mean, if it could run for another six weeks, let's say, in order to give it that 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 that, that period of gestation that the plays need to arrive at a certain place, but we can't invest that way well, off off Broadway, especially not the nonprofit situation. One of the solutions to that is, as it used to be, that the company establishes itself that you have a group of actors that you have something like La Mama Troupe or the Living Theater. You have people who work together constantly and it's the company reputation that sustains you through the new play and the old play and the play that's a complete risk. But as, Ju uh, 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 as, as Judith will tell you, it is becoming increasingly more, in, more and more difficult to sustain a troupe or a group of people you know, doing this, the, the same work. When Ellen, uh, in 1969, when Ellen got her first permanent venue, the, the, the theater that you saw at the opening day. Um, she instigated a program which, of course, no one had ever heard of before. She had five resident companies. She had the Plexus, she had the ETC company, she had the La Mama Troupe. She had, she had invited, she literally created five different companies because it was a time where uh, certainly <coughs> grants could be given to sustain the artist for a length of time, certainly from one year to the next. Well, it became evident that were not evident, but it became a problem to the powers that be that actors were being paid whether or not they belong to a union. Okay, this became a problem. Uh, the union's problem. Ellen, in her good intentions were you have people rehearsing all of the time, you have a repertory theater season that you can that you can present all different companies one right after the other, you have am, uh, ample space. She bought a building that had seven rehearsal spaces in it. Because you have this rehearsal space, this is a godsend for a theater company and any visiting company. Because what it means is you can rehearse for a number of weeks in a good space and then move into the theater rather quickly, 
present your piece and have it at, at least at, at close to what it should be to, for the greatest success. Um, no other theater had this. I mean, when the public first opened, Joe Papp was renting space from Ellen for rehearsal because they couldn't sustain, they didn't have these options. These were developments of a mind of a woman who was thinking, constantly thinking, how can I make things easier for the artist to be able to flourish? And of course, the real difficulty that happened with the subsidizing of the five troops was not particularly the union problem, which was could eventually have been negotiated over, but it was the drying up of the, the National Endowment of the, right. for the Arts, Precisely. which was subsidizing these. And we know what that came from, mm -hmm. which was the right wing putting pressure on the government to <coughs> curb what had gotten mobilized in the first instance under the Republicans. Right. Because I, I have to admit with embarrassment, I served on the National Endowment's theater advisory panel under President Nixon. <laughs> I'm awfully sorry about the last part of that sentence. I'm not sorry about the good we did. But that is a struggle. You have a country where, as, as Judith says, the culture and the society, and particularly the commercial structure of the society, are out of touch or committed against each other. And there are these glaring problems. The yeah. NEA's budget the is NEA, $165 million. It's, the you know, the, 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 the NEA right? is pinned to the floor and is not likely to get up again. I mean, yeah, it's a soon. systemic problem. I mean, the Small Business Administration has $400 billion to help out small businesses and theaters and arts groups aren't accepted in the society as legitimate small businesses. It's but a, you know what? I have complete confidence that there's another Judith Molina, another Edward Albee, another Ellen Stewart lurking somewhere who's going to come up with a solution and not bother with the statistics. You know, eventually, because you can't, you can't Aren't stop. Are those people it. out there? I think the statistics like are necessary for the solution. I mean, yeah. that's the only no. way the people that are within the hierarchy, hierarchy that oppresses us, are going to understand the solution. Is yeah. if we can show them the actual financial figures of what we're doing and what we create. For instance, the company of 25 actors in the Living Theaters Ensemble rehearsed for 12 weeks, and if we paid them $10 an hour, which we didn't, they rehearsed for free, they contributed about $45,000 effort into the production. Sure. And that's a major investment. Sure. That's 25 producers, not 25 One, one of the things that puzzles me about what you said, Brad, is that I don't understand the Small Business Administration mm -hmm. not realizing that Statistically, it's been proven over and over again that the arts, and in particular the performing arts, are always a source of economic yeah, stimulus right, right. to a community. I'm getting a signal from the aisle back there. Can we turn on the house lights here? Because I can't see very much in this glare. And it's rather about the time when we are expected to take a few questions from the listeners. So. This performance is now interactive. <laughs> if somebody has a question, yeah, we and, uh, now we can see each other. Yes. Ah, can you take these down a little so that I, I can adjust my ancient eyes? Who has a question? We'll take one in front here. And that guy in the back. I'm yes, you're, you're second, sir. Yes, I'm. I'm. Stand up and speak. Oh, good Project. Goodness. You haven't got a mic. <laughs> uh, it's. It's a. I guess a trivial question that's not really worth projecting, but uh, the, 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 the post-war theater, I was wondering <coughs> if you, it's, it's my impression, which may or may not be correct, that, that part of what, and I think actually you alluded to it by referring to, to Auden and Isherwood, I, my, my guess is that the, the New York City arts community was very much uh, enlivened by European refugees. Oh, indeed. Yeah, all, 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 all the arts were. That's not a question, that's a no. book. No. That <laughs> European refugees who came over here in the third, and Elizabeth Bergner, by want, the way, uh, you, and her husband. If you want to find the one, decent, one important thing that Hitler accomplished in his life uh, was, was to bring culture yeah. Avant-garde yes. culture exactly. from Europe to the United States. Erwin <laughs> Piscator, <laughs> as a matter of fact. <laughs> we are totally indebted, and, and Brecht, 
and the court while. We are totally indebted to these people. No, the gentleman who had his hand up in, in back. Yeah, I'm wondering where you see the future of Sirius Theater, um, where the epicenter of that is going to be, and also the, the problem of serious playwrights who can't necessarily make a living at it and get drawn into the television world and mm -hmm. they essentially stop writing plays. Um, so if you can answer that question, those questions. Or what's the worse, they start writing is. plays like their television plays. Did everyone hear this question? Yes. No? no? No. First of all, what the question is, what is the epicenter of the experimental theater going to be? And secondly, the problem of the playwright. What do we do to, keep, to rescue the playwrights from television and other forms of writing for money? Panelists? And in, in, in our theater, uh, uh, the more collectivity, the better. Uh, so that I like to say that I am the, the author of the five books of Moses, whoever that may be, uh, uh, is the author of, of Korach. But really, the company created the play together. And uh, I, 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 I treasure those who have the playwriting skills among us who can contribute on that level just as those who can do choreography contribute on that level. Uh, everybody does everything. Uh, I think that the future lies in companies, in the ensemble, in uh, an ensemble that is able to stay together. Now, we've been able to stay together in spite of the fact that we have no money, uh, because everybody's willing to live on this dreadful poverty level. Uh, and, and I don't even want to tell you how far that goes. Some of it isn't even legal uh, in terms of what we're allowed to do. Uh, but we have to stay together. And somehow the Living Theatre has managed to do this, has managed to remain an ensemble uh, for some 65 years. Uh, that's hard to do. It means there's a lot of people there that are burning to do the work that are willing to work without money, uh, that are willing to, if necessary, uh, sleep on the stage of the theater uh, instead of being able to pay rent. Uh, these are terrible things, but it's kept us together. And I think the future is in the ensemble, is in working with people you've worked with before, where you can develop ideas, style, poetry, language, uh, forms, all that can be developed if you have an ensemble. Edward, we, we, you're we, the person I have to ask about this. <laughs> we, we misinform ourselves uh, if you don't remember that, well, the plays, the important and wonderful plays that, that have come to us from the 19th century, from the 20th century, and into the 21st century. The plays that really, really matter, they were always in the minority. The junk and the mediocrity was always much more popular. Never, never forget that. No, nothing has changed in the theater except that it all costs a fucking lot more. <laughs> the junk and the mediocrity is still much more popular. People are encouraged by the majority critics, not including you, <laughs> to lower their taste. And, and it, it is all exactly as, as it has been. And, and, and if, you, if you have the kind of talent that is not going to be very, very popular, well, then you're stuck with it. You're either going to keep doing what you, what you do well and hope that somebody will pay attention to it, or uh, you're going to sell out. And unfortunately, the majority of the people who really know what they're doing don't know how to sell out. <laughs> That's the advantage they have. They are protected from TV by their own inability to write that kind of That's junk. I, I have to cite one last predecessor who was the, the playwright who abetted the creation of the an off-Broadway equivalent in Edwardian London. His name was George Bernard Shaw, and he and his colleagues created the Court Theatre 
and they ran it for eight years at a deficit which Shaw's wealthy wife made up at the end of every year. And at the end of this, they collected all the statistics in a book to which he wrote a preface and he listed a all- A very long preface. Customarily, a very long preface in which he listed all the great achievements, the European plays they had premiered, the ancient Greek classics they had revived, all the new English plays and the whole new school of English playwriting that they had encouraged. And he listed all the kinds of people from every walk of life who had come to his theater, scientists and musicians and physicians and, and government officials. And then he said, I don't think that playgoing London came to see us to any great extent. <laughs> this has always struck me as the single most tragic sentence in Bernard Shaw. Uh, I, think, I, think I, have, in, in, uh, I have a concern regarding what, what you addressed. I think we are manufacturing too many disposable playwrights, hmm. and by that I mean it's become too easy to put up a play for three weeks and then forget about it and then have to do it again. No one is working to establish or to create something of any greater, longer lasting value. Not, I should say no one. There are people out there, but I think that we're sending our youth, our young people, the wrong message by this, this uh, immediate uh, uh, accumulation of so much disposable material because of the television writing, because of the immediate movie, the success, the the rap song mixed with the you know the, the go go dance or whatever. Dare uh, I mention the word internet? This, well, there you are. Instant know. results for everything. Yeah, not everyone who blogs is a writer. Uh, mm -hmm. Not everybody who, who belongs on Facebook is, is you know can be a playwright. And I don't care how you how many friends you accumulate, it doesn't necessarily make you a literary person. Um, and so I think what's happening though is that I, I think we're losing our mentors. I think we're losing the, the Edward Albies and, and the others if we don't support them, if we don't put out, make the effort to make sure that they are produced and that they are seen, then we are shortchanging our own future. Uh, it's very important, I think, that we follow through on this, uh, just as, as an audience and also as a people, as a nation. Here, here. Yeah. Judith. I have just finished uh, writing a book uh, it's supposed to come out this year by uh, uh, Rookledge, is it? Yes, Rookledge. Uh, uh, and it's a, it's a story of Erwin Piscotter's struggle in the United States <clears throat> to be a director, to direct plays. He ran a wonderful school, a school that's been seminal in the whole history. The, 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 while I was there, there were three acting teachers that were working on different, different, in different rooms at the same time, Lee Strasberg and Stella Adler and uh, 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 Herbert, uh, 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 Herbert Berghoff, and they were all working in one, in, 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 in one space and, and struggling with each other unbelievably. <coughs> and I have written this story about, speaking of tragedy, this man who wanted to establish a theater in America and couldn't do it, and went back in to, to Europe in utter despair, uh, writing back home to his wife, Maria Ray, uh, I have failed in my life, I have failed in my art, nobody wants me. And for 11 years, toured from city to city in, in, in Germany, uh, 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 doing plays in various provincial theaters until finally Billy Brunt became the uh, uh, <clears throat> became the, uh, the mayor of, of Berlin and gave him the key to his post unit and he produced immediately the three seminal political plays of our time: the Deputy, uh, the um, Investigation. Investigation and the case of, of, of uh, Oppenheim. All, all those three plays that were his uh, fulfillment of his promise. If he only had a theater and a company, and he finally did, and he couldn't find it in America, and um, I, that was a tragic situation. It didn't end too tragically because he finally did succeed. 
but it is a struggle, and this struggle uh, is is a historical struggle, and and the Scotter went through it, and you heard about my mama uh, going through it, and you hear about a great playwright like Edward Albee going through it, the struggle to survive, <clears throat> the struggle to be able to do our work, <clears throat> which is all we ask. Well, that sounds like a summary to me. Um, but I dare say there are, is at least one more question. Is there one? Yes. Yeah. What can we do to uh, foster more government support of the theater? <laughs> oh, <laughs> is it possible? Fabulous. Yeah. yeah, we won back about 25% of the cuts from the DCA this year by lobbying. You know, there's Art New York, there's Fourth Arts Block that La Mama's a part of. There are a bunch of advocacy groups. Each community board now has a arts and culture task force. It's not quite committee level, but there are lots of people that go to these meetings that fight for exactly that. You're it's, talking local. Yeah, yes. local. The Department of Cultural Affairs, DCA. Yeah. Um, I don't think anything will work except revolution, but that's not <laughs> 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 one. We, we have to create a cultural environment in which it is understood mm -hmm. that it is that we are the only animal that creates art. Yes. Mm, right. And that is our distinction and our ultimate value, that we are the only animal that creates art. And the more we can pay proper attention to the arts because of that, mm -hmm. uh, then possibly we will have government support that makes some sense. But you have to have artistic education in our schools, which we no longer have very much anymore. And, and, you, and you have to have a culture that, that respects excellence over commerce. Yes. Now, there's something which I'm never sure is possible in America, because people are so fixated on commerce. This is the only country in the world, I believe, where after a new movie opens at the beginning of the next week, they don't talk about how good the movie is compared to other movies. They publish the grosses from the first weekend. How do we do it? Anybody up there? Any solution? Yes. I have a question back here. Okay. It's for you, Mr. Feingold. I was wondering if you believe that theater can spur the revolution or it's just a dogged faith that some of us strive towards. If we can do what? I'm sorry, say it again. I'm wondering if you believe that theater can spur the revolution or if it is a dogged faith that some of us strive for. Well, there are so many revolutions and yeah. so many people strive for. Which, which revolution? one are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Which British revolution yeah. are you talking about? I'm talking about right now. Making change in our world, do you believe, Mr. Feingold, that we can do this through theater? That is an interesting question, and I am not sure of the answer, but I can tell you a couple of things. One is that the theater is a place to make people think and feel, and those things abet change. I'm always cautious about the word revolution. And I also like something that the very radical 1960s British playwright John Arden said, which is, the theater cannot make you do something, but it can confirm you in something that you are beginning to feel. That's good. Which means it can give you the strength to think about how you might change things. Is that a good enough answer? Yeah. <laughs> Hey. But it is only in a functioning democracy that these things can happen. Mm -hmm. And we must be very, very careful that the democracy that we, we all pretend uh, we love so much is still in existence in this country. There are people who would like to do away with it. As Bernie Sanders said on the Senate floor, these people don't want to govern, they want to rule. Right. Yes. I'm curious about the group theater and how that impacted 
you, Judith and, and Edward, just the group theater. Mm -hmm. Well, the group theater more or less stopped uh, around what 1942. Didn't I think so. Yeah, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get out of school until 1945, so I can't speak about the group theater except what I read about it afterwards and, and, and all of the extraordinary things that it did. But you knew many people who were involved. Oh, sure. With it. The, so, the socio-political activities. Uh, uh, it was basically uh, in, intellectually uh, and, and politically leftist. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, most art is. I, I was mentioning something at, 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 at the Kennedy Center Honors last week, that I've, been, I've been around for a long time, and I've met almost all of the people who really have mattered in all of the arts, the really, really good people in almost all of the arts over the past 50 years, I've met them. And I happen to mention very, very casually, you know, the interesting thing is, almost every single one of them was a Democrat. <laughs> yes. Uh, when I went to performing arts, unbeknownst to me, there were a number of students whose parents had been victims of what happened in the 50s with the McCarthy year, etc. And many of those people had been instru not instrumental, but had belonged to many of the, the intellectual circles that had that had grown out of things like the group theater and, and many of the things that had come before. And even in the 60s, they were still suffering the stigmas of what had happened in, 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 in that period because the children's names had been changed. Uh, they would speak things. I found that some of my friend's parents had written Broadway shows and were given over to someone else. In other words, they were working literally working undercover because the artists themselves had been in, in some way blacklisted and, uh, and to me it was an un unconscionable, uh, a, a crazy, a, a unbelievable thing. But uh, what I see happening is we, we develop in waves. The uh, Provincetown Playhouse, for instance, a little bit of the history of the Provincetown Playhouse, one of the things that amazed me was there were so many women writers. Edna St. Vincent and Millay, playwrights, and produced and here which as well as Eugene O'Neill. Because prior to that, there hadn't been recognized women writers for working in the theater, and many of them had been journalists formerly. Second thing that happened, now here's another wave. In the 60s, suddenly, at La Mama, we suddenly have women directors, mm. and tremendous women playwrights. We've got Megan Perry, we've got Julie Rovasi, we've got Michelle Owens, we've got many, many people. Uh, but suddenly, you know, a, a couple of years later, you look on Broadway and you've got five or six women directors. Something unheard of when I was going to school. There were no women directors on Broadway. Well, there actually so, were, you know, they were the, they were, invi they were invisible people. This right. is a, one of the Broadway paradoxes that has yeah. always fascinated me. Uh, the Tony Award, the Antoinette Perry Award, is named for a woman director. And it wasn't until this past decade that a woman director actually won one, and she was from Ireland. <laughs> it means, I mean, a great many American women directors had come and gone. Or, I, or, I will take the Tony Awards much more seriously when they are not limited to plays on Broadway, mm -hmm. but when they're plays that are off Broadway and out of New York as well. That too is a revolution of which we await. Michael, one, one more question. One more question. We have time for one more question, they say. I wanted to speak about what you said on mentors and passing the torch. I have the privilege to be currently working with both Joan Claude Van Itali, I'm directing his play, Tibetan Book of the Dead, and Mel Howard as a producer who I know has worked with Living Theater before. It's overwhelming to be with these men because they've done so much. And as a young person, the next generation, I'm sure you understand, how does one respectfully carry on the tradition and pass, receive that torch that has been forged, this incredible trail has been blazed and then all these obstacles come in from where we are now, how does one carry on the tradition as the next generation? She works with Jean-Claude and Mel Howard and wants to know how mentors can pass on and how, how, how the can receive mentors can carry on the tradition. 
Judith? Uh, if you uh, if you come to me, I'll listen to you. <laughs> and if you have something to offer me, I'll be very happy to accept you into my work. Great. <laughs> Edward? <coughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I have lots of questions, very few answers to anything. Um, <laughs> Respect what should be respected, learn from what should be learned, and don't pay quite so much attention. Try more important, it's more important to be good than to be popular. <laughs> Just keep all of that in mind. <laughs> um, I will tomorrow. Yes, mine too. Think about what, you, what inspires you, what you find in someone else's work that really inspires you and then examine that. Seriously examine that, you know, the whys and wherefore. The other thing is, don't be afraid, okay, to approach these people, okay? You've asked a wonderful question. You've got answers here from the best, the very best, okay? So by coming to this kind of a reunion, by putting yourself in the situation, by presenting yourself and saying, I'm interested in, in I too am interested in what you do, uh, you make yourself available, and uh, you've got the best source, the best. And I have a little advice about that, too, because I have been mentored by some very, very great people. And my advice is always ask questions, always listen to the answers, and think about them very carefully, and always be ready to argue when the answers seem wrong. Because quite often we're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> or we're right, but we're right about 20 years ago. <laughs>